Assalamu alaikum. It is uh, a great honor and a great privilege to bring you uh, greetings from across the pond. My name is Ubaidullah Evans. I am from Chicago, um, Illinois, and I work as the executive director of the American Learning Institute for Muslims. And um, we're here in the UK touring a couple of campuses uh, from some colleges and universities talking to young Muslims about different uh, topics. And the topic of our discussion, and when I say discussion, I don't intend that as a formality. I appreciate exchange. If you want to get up and say everything you're saying is rubbish, you'll be wrong. <laughs> but you can do that if you choose. Um, the topic of our exchange today is compassion, empathy, and generosity, and why these characteristics should be of primary importance to us as Muslims. And it's interesting that we're having this discussion now because all of us have witnessed the emergence of ISIS. I'm not going to talk about politics. I might get yanked off the stage if I did. Nonetheless, for me, as someone that has ghayra, the word ghayra in Arabic is like, uh, who can help me? Ghayra is uh, protectiveness, or to have uh, a feeling of, um, it's more than jealousy, it's like protectiveness. I have a sense of ghayra about Islam. So when I see Islam depicted in the media, in a way that is patently vile, ugly, disgusting, detestable. It is something that personally hurts me. And when you look at this, one has to think, what kind of hearts can produce such ugliness? One of our mashaykh, he said to us, remember, every act of beauty Every act of kindness, every act of generosity that you see in the world emanates from a human heart. And every act of ugliness, every act of vileness, every act of filth similarly generates, is generated by a human heart. And this is nothing but an elaboration of what the Prophet Muhammad said وسلم, when he said, Truly, in the body there is a lump of flesh. In saluhat, salahatul jismul kullu. If it is sound, then the entire body is sound. Wa in fasadat, fasadatil jasadu kullu. But if it is corrupted, then the entire body is corrupted. Now what I would like to submit to you is that yes, without question, ISIS and movements similar to ISIS come out of an entire ecology of violence and brutality. ISIS, ISIS was not developed in a vacuum. People don't just wake up and say, this is what we want to do. And a lot of the violence and brutality that produced that movement was perpetrated, carried out, aided, and abetted by my own great country, the United States of America. However, that said, we must reject such ugliness. We must reject such vileness. And we must proclaim from the rooftops that such behavior cannot be associated with the pure way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a man concerning whom it has been written that no one was more generous, no one was more loving, no one was more gentle, no one was more approachable, and this in the face of forces that behave inhumanely towards him. 
And the Prophet والسلام, was always behaving with generosity and magnanimity towards even those who oppressed him. It's very interesting. When the Prophet والسلام, entered Mecca, and you have to understand something about the pre-modern world. When you go back to a place that you were exiled, you go back as a conqueror. And there is usually a stream of blood that follows your re-entry of that territory. And when the Prophet wasallam said to the Meccans, what do you think I'm going to do with you? They were clever. They said, we don't know, but you are a generous brother and you're the son of a generous brother. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Ruhu antumu'tulaqa, go, for you are free. In spite of all of the violence that was carried out against the Muslims, in spite of the fact that his beloved uncle Hamza was killed and then mutilated, in spite of the fact that he had lost countless numbers of companions to this internus and violence that existed between the Meccans and the Muslims. Ruhu anta because he was a man of magnanimity in victory and in defeat. And Muslims, we have been economically depressed before. Muslims have been politically disadvantaged before. Muslims have experienced dictatorial power carried out against them in different epochs within history. But Muslims have never made Islam ugly. Never. The Prophet ﷺ said, Inna Allah jameel wa yuhibbun jamal. Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty. We have never allowed any of the vicissitudes of life or history to push us to a place of making this deen something ugly. And the Prophet ﷺ said, in terms of gentleness, Allah does not include it in anything illa zayyana, except that he beautifies thereby. وَلَا أَزَالَهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا شَانَ And he does not remove gentleness from anything except that that thing is marred by the removal of that gentleness. Once, I'll tell you a lighter story, because I see everyone looking at me like, this is kind of heavy for midday. <laughs> and indeed it is. Once a man came to the Prophet ﷺ, and he had 10 children with him. No, in fact, he did not have 10 children with him. As they were speaking, a child approached them, and the Prophet ﷺ rubbed the child's head, and then he kissed the child on his forehead, and then he kissed the child on his head. And the man said, in a spirit of machismo, you know, <clears throat> I have 10 children, and I have never kissed any of them. You kiss children? And he said with incredulity, you kiss children? Kind of like this is something that is something that takes away from your manliness, that you kiss children publicly. And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, I kiss children. And what do I have in this deen for someone for whom rahmah has been removed from their heart? This is, the, this is the definitive stamp of his sunnah. This is the definitive stamp of our religion. Allah said, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have only sent you as a mercy to all that exist. And somewhere down the line, and perhaps somehow, in some inexplicable way, we have forgotten the necessity of that mercy. Having lived among the Muslims for a very long time, I can say with confidence, we have produced some of the most authoritarian cultures known to man. A culture in which everyone who has a position of authority over anyone else is going to make them feel, carry, and bear the full burden of being their subordinate. This is what we have produced. You go to the Muslim world and bosses are treated like dictators. 
Husbands are dictators over their wives and their families. Children are dictators over the, of, of the smaller and less capable children. Mothers are dictators over the children. We have a culture of istibdad. The word in Arabic is istibdad, of despotism, and tyranny. And it exists at every societal level. There's a feminist writer from Morocco, and I take issue with some of what she writes, but some of what she writes is of interest, named Fatima Nurmisi. And she talks about, you know, of course she's talking about the horrors of patriarchal culture, but one of the things she said that I thought was spot on was that it's not simply this male-dominated society uh, that exists at the top with the dictator, the strong man. It's something that plays out at every other level of society, within families, within places of employment, within political parties, and everywhere else. And then I was reading Sheikh Kawakibi, who was a 19th century Syrian scholar, and he was saying something, I think, something wider, something more vast. He said, it's not simply male domination. It is that we have produced an authoritarian culture, period, in which no one deals with power responsibly. And so it's easy for women to say, well, men are doing it. But all of us are doing it at different levels. And we have to investigate this. And we have to hold this here and hold the sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, here and see where they converge and where they diverge. I'll tell you a story. And for me, this story kind of sums it up. The Prophet ﷺ was talking to Umm Salama. This is Umm Salama, right? Her husband, Abu Salama, was martyred at Uhud. And the Prophet ﷺ said to her, you know, Allah could give you better than Abu Salama. And she was deeply in love with her late husband when he passed away. So she said quizzically, who could ever be better than Abu Salama? And the Prophet ﷺ said, well, you know I am a prophet, right? <laughs> you know I am a prophet, you know. And she said, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Are you alluding to like me and you possibly being together? He said, yeah, that's right. That's what I'm alluding to, right? She said, absolutely not. I have no interest in that. Now, what I find interesting about this is this is a woman standing in the presence of the Prophet <laughs> who believes that he receives revelation from the top seven heavens. This is the Amin of the Rabbul Alameen. This is the trustworthy one who is vouchsafed with revelation from the Rabbul Alameen, from the Lord of everything that exists, and yet he's not good enough to be my husband. And the Prophet ﷺ does not use his authority coercively. How dare you say that to me? Your dua will never be accepted now. He didn't throw acid in her face like people do in the Muslim world when their proposals are rejected. How he did what every man whose proposal is rejected does. He said, why not? Why not? What's wrong with me? She said, well, there's three reasons that me and you, we could never be together. One is you're married already, and I'm very jealous. That won't work for me. Two, I'm a mature woman. I'm, in a sense, set in my ways. I'm not malleable. And three, I have children. And the Prophet ﷺ responded, as for your jealousy, Allah will help you with that. Now men don't try that. The Prophet ﷺ, he can say that. You can't say that. You can't say that. Because when he says it, he means it. As for your jealousy, Allah will help you with that. As for the fact that you're a mature woman, I appreciate your maturity because I'm a mature man. And as for the fact that you have children, I promise you, they will be like my children. And then she said, yes, I will marry you. 
And that's how she became one of the mothers of the believers. Now think about that mode of leadership. A person who is an absolute leader, because he's the prophet of Allah, alayhi salam, who a woman who believes in him can tell him in full confidence, I don't want to be your wife, and not worry at all about being invalidated or having her faith questioned. That's the kind of man he was, alayhi salam. And this is what is lacking in these completely authoritarian structures that exist within our families and in our communities. And we have to do something about that. You know, Amr ibn al-As recorded, and you can find this in the Shama'il of Imam al-Tirmidhi, that when we sat in the company of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, every one of us would emerge from that gathering saying, I swear I am his favorite. He likes me the most. Why? Because he knew how to smile at everybody. He knew how to engage everybody. He knew how to make everybody feel special. You know what I'm saying? My man here. <laughs> Good man. Good man. Good man. Love the hair. Good man. He knew how to make everybody feel special. And he did this to such an extent that on one occasion, Amr went to the Prophet ﷺ and he had the nerve he was emboldened to ask, Ya Rasulullah, Who's the most beloved of the people to you? And he just knew he was going to say, You, because that's how well he treated him. And the Prophet, والسلام, with characteristic honesty, right? The most beloved of all of the people to me? Mm, Aisha, my wife. And Amr said, oh yeah, well I know, how, you know, husband and wife, that's a very close relationship. But after her, then who? After her, it would probably have to be her father, Abu Bakr. Well, you know, father-in-law, and you guys have a long-standing friendship. I, I get that, I get that. After him, then who? After him, uh, probably Omar ibn al-Khattab. After that, who? Uthman. You know? And you know, it, just, you know, it just kept going and it just kept going. And he said that he was shocked that the Prophet ﷺ didn't say, you are, because of the way he treated him. This is the way he was, sallallahu alayhi wa We even see this when once the Prophet ﷺ was sitting there. These are stories that are absolutely authentic in their provenance. We know the sources that they come from, but nobody talks about them. The Prophet is sitting with a group of the male Sahaba, and a woman approaches them boldly, intrepidly, and she says, not paraphrasing, what about women? The men are traveling with you, the men have access to you, they can sit and ask their questions and you teach them their religion. There are verses in the Quran about what they're going to receive in heaven. What about women? We want to learn this religion. We want access to you. We have questions. And in one riwayah, one recension of this event, the Prophet ﷺ stepped back and he asked Omar, what do you think about this? And Omar ibn al-Khattab said, Wallahi, I did not know a woman was capable of that. And this was not an expression of misogyny. This was an expression of uh, familiarity or unfamiliarity. I don't know women to be so bold as to address a leader in publicly, so eloquently and so fearlessly. I've never seen anything like that. And the Prophet ﷺ explained to him calmly, this is quite normal. Women are capable of this. And then he told that woman, no problem, your request is granted. You guys choose a day, just the Sahabiyat, Ridwan alayhin ajma'in, and I'll sit with you, teaching you, instructing you, and answering your questions. And so they did that. Until the Prophet وسلم, until his demise, he would sit with the women of the companions and just answer their questions and uh, attend to them. And on one occasion, as they were sitting together, Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab descended on the gathering. 
And all of the women started running. As soon as they saw him, they just took off. Pew, 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 pew. Shooting off in each direction. And he called out to them, Ya a'da'i anfusi kunna. Oh, you enemies unto yourselves. You express fear of me, but you can sit in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? How so? You guys don't really know what power is. And they said, but the, this is the point that I, I want you to focus on. Yes, the Prophet is majestic. They didn't say that, but that was implied. But he's agreeable, gentle, kind, and approachable. You, on the other hand, we find you quite frightening. And Sayyidina Umar kind of looked at the Prophet and the Prophet said, Omar, it's true. You are like that, <laughs> you know. But there's also, look, look at his beauty, alayhi salatu wasalam. Now, many people read this hadith, and we read it as a witticism. We read it in a very lighthearted way. Like, oh, you know, it's true and it's funny. That was devastating for Omar. The thing that he desired most ardently was to be like the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. And here he was being told that you're not like the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. So this actually, Omar was crestfallen at this. He was, oh, what? You mean we're not similar? Now understand something about Omar. Some people estimate that he was maybe 6'8 in height. He had a thick beard and he had a long mustache. He said, Canada, you fought Tilo. He used to twist his mustache. Mm. That's, how he would, that's how he would idle. Mm. All right. He was bald. Kana asla. He was bald. Don't get afraid of me. It's nothing to be afraid of. I didn't choose to be this way. Nature chose. You know. uh, and he was very, very strong. He was very brawny. So the Prophet والسلام, looked at him and said, Omar, but it's okay. You don't go one way except that the shaitan goes the other way. So he was saying, while your bold and domineering personality has some challenging aspects, like the fact that you scare pious Muslim women, that same boldness and that same domineering demeanor also scares the shaitan. So that was a way of him kind of uplifting his friend. We are different in some ways, but there are some things about you that are things that I like that are uh, very, very positive. This is how the Prophet was, just a real generosity of spirit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ غَلِيدَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ قَلْتُ مِنْ If you were hard-hearted at all, speaking to the Prophet والسلام, the people would have fled from you. They would have fled from you. وَلَكِنْ بِرَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ لَنْ تَلَهُمْ But by God's grace, you are soft and gentle with them. This is how we're called upon to be. We are called upon to be people of gentleness, people of beauty, people of humility, people of generosity. The Prophet ﷺ said in an authentic hadith, أَتَبَصُّمْ فِي وَجْهِ أَخِيكَ صَدَقَةً Smiling in the face of your brother is a sadaqa. Now, for all of you cheapskates out there, human appeal needs more than smiles. But, what that hadith is asserting is that whether you have money or not, generosity is something that comes from within. The Prophet ﷺ also taught every time you wake up, every joint in your body must perform an act of sadaqah. And, uh, and one of the things we have recorded about him is that he used to dispense everything in his possession every day before he retired at night. This is how he was, alayhi salatu wasalam. Now, no one is asking you to do that. But we're saying, take from that example and bring it into your life so that you can become a person of greater compassion, and greater empathy, and greater sensitivity. And um, I think, personally, the future of Islam rests on our ability to do that. The uh, people that are trying to destroy Islam, and let me tell you, and I'm not a conspiratorial 
you know, there's three guys in a room with white jackets and white gloves pressing buttons and destroying the Muslims. No, no, no. There are people who are frustrated by the fact that Islam is the last thing that I think will prevent a secular, democratic, laissez-faire capitalist monoculture. That, that will make the world really in the, 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 the words of the American economist uh, Thomas Friedman, flat. There's a book called The World is Flat, which means now the world, when they say the world is flat, they mean flat for commerce. That, they're, that now, you know, we have a monoculture that will enable us to do business from coast to coast without borders. And Islam is the only thing that still has this connection to the pre-modern world that just frustrates that process a little bit. All of these rebellions and this deep religious uh, feeling. And, and so you have people, and they, in America, they talk about this candidly, that our war against Muslims is an ideological war. We want to prove to them that our way, and by that they mean uh, Western culture, is more attractive than what they have. And we want them to give up what they have in preference to what we have. This is, this is how in policy making places in America, this is how they're talking. And you have the wisest among them saying things like, we will get further in Iraq with Hollywood movies than we will with bombs. This is what they call now soft power. I talked to maybe two or three people here studying international relations. So I'm sure you're familiar with the term soft power, to have an attractive culture. And this is precisely where we're losing. Even Muslims themselves are looking at our culture and thinking, ugh, it's vile. You see, I mean, you see somebody publicly decapitating somebody, violence and voyeurism, it's vile. And what we have to do is say, no, that is not the kind of personality that Islam produces. Islam produces a personality imbued with empathy and sensitivity that appreciates beauty and that wants to do everything excellently. I'll end with this. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, كَتَبُ اللَّهُ إِحْسَانًا عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ Allah has written excellence on everything. Everything you do, try and do it excellently. Try to do it with, with breathtaking and profound beauty. This is who we are. This is um, the kind of culture that will lead to our renaissance. And it starts in the hearts of every individual Muslim. It's not going to be some grand political project, no. It's a commitment to those kinds of virtues in your heart that will lead to this ummah regaining its rightful place um, as uh, an exemplar of the highest human ideals. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. The fair.